Oi, mate, there's you. I believe it is. Wicked. You coaching football. You are a legend for doing something so stupid. I mean, it's mental. They're gonna murder you. This is a bit of news from the other side of the Atlantic. AFC Richmond announced the hiring of their new manager, American football coach Ted Lasso. You're an American who's now in charge of a football club, despite possessing very little knowledge of the game. Oh! I know that AFC Richmond is going to give you everything they got, win or lose. Or tie. Right, y'all do ties here. Did you see that? He must be from England, yeah. Wales, is that another country? Yes and no. How many countries are in this country? Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to start by talking about your background. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> You're kind okay. of a, a jack of all trades. I mean, you are an actor, writer, director, producer, stand-up comedian, podcaster. When did you know that you wanted to get into film? Um, and then do you feel like you kind of were drawn to any one particular area? Or did you know from the beginning that you kind of wanted to dip your toes in uh, all waters? Uh, Oh man, I don't know. Uh, I, I started, I definitely started just loving film and wanting to make films and to be an actor in films. And then, and then I think once I realized, oh, you, 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 you make them as well. I guess I wanted to do all, okay, I think I always wanted to do all of it, but I also think perhaps I have the, um, I don't have the focus for one of them. So I, so I do all of them. Because it's it actually works better if I do lots of different ones. I have found, like as mad as it is to do six jobs at once, I think I'm better at doing six jobs at once than I am at doing one job. Do you know what I mean? Right. And do you feel that any one particular focus kind of helped prepare you for a different aspect of it? For example, like doing stand-up comedy. Do you feel yeah. like more comfortable? in front of the screen or even writing your own material as a comedian? Did that prepare you for writing episodics? It's what I think is good about stand-up. Tr truthfully, what I think is, is good about doing stand-up is that there's a, there's a, it does something to your brain. Uh, do you do stand-up? Have you done stand-up? <laughs> the, the, the just sort of magical pressure of standing on a stage in front of a room full of people, I don't know if it will ever happen again in this world, but I hope it does standing on a stage with a microphone with lights on you the pressure that you have to say something funny you best you better fucking come up with something no we're too late but you have to like do something the adrenaline and what it does to your brain is it makes your brain work 300 times faster than normal and it also gives you shortcuts, it, it, it sort of teaches you, you go, you don't need to say all this shit, you can just say this, you can just get to that. And I do think that helps with writing because you end up working out the shortest path, the, the best path quicker because your brain is used to panic. <laughs> you develop a good sense of panic. And uh, so yeah, I think that that's, like I find, when I haven't done stand-ups, sometimes even when I'm really, really busy with all the other things, I still go and do like a, even just a 10 minute new material night, just to kind of like electroshock therapy for my brain. Like, oh, there you go, that was terrifying. Back to, do you know what I mean? I love that. Uh, also, yeah. Did you yeah. have to in theater as well before you did stand-up? Did I, sorry, I, I lost you, did I have, did you ever have a background in theater before you transitioned to stand up? Yeah, I did play. I used to, I don't know if you know, in the UK, we have the Edinburgh Festival, which is like this big every, so every year before I did stand up, I used to like write plays and take them up to Edinburgh and act in them. And I just was finding, but I did find, and I say this with love, I, I didn't, necessarily love the people in that in the in the plays <laughs> in this in this environment but I love doing it I love doing it but I kept thinking I don't think these are my people like I like the stuff but the hanging out I'm not having the best time <laughs> and then I found comedy and I was like ah oh, this is this is this is for your crowd absolutely now, I, now I'm at peace in total panic with everything Okay. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, but that, yeah, and also I do think with plays, ninety-five percent of plays I think are more fun to be in than they are to watch. <laughs> I come from a theater background as well, so I agree. I, I think we get more fun than all the like it or not, Richmond are changing the way we do things. And from now on, that way is the lasso way. Hey, look, this car's got an invisible steering wheel. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I want to start by talking with uh, Ted Lasso, which I finished yeah. this week. So much fun, first of all. Oh, okay. What a great show to just be out in the world right now. I want to kind of know how you got involved. Um, and then mm -hmm. specifically, if you could talk a little bit of behind the scenes uh, as your role of executive um, story editor, because that's kind of a specific title, and I think it would be fun to kind of hear more about what your role really entails with that. Okay. Well, I got involved with it as a writer because I had worked, I'd done a pilot, I'd acted in a pilot for Bill Lawrence a few years ago. It was a really good pilot. I don't know why I didn't get picked up, because I genuinely, I have no idea because it was really good, but I did get picked up, but we stayed in touch, and... Um, he literally called me out of the blue and said, I'm working on this show. I think you'd be right for it. Come out to LA and write on it. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> I was quite busy at the time. And he said, just cancel everything and come out here. And I was like, but I have a life. <laughs> and he was like, I don't care. Just come out here. And so I went and I'd never done an American writer's room. I'd written, I'd been writing stuff in England, but not an American writer's room. And it's such a different beast to what I'm used to, certainly it, just in sheer numbers as well. Like I'm used to writing with two or three people maximum. And you know, the writer's room is 12 people around the table. And you know, it's intimidating. In the first day it's like, oh, oh fuck it hell. <laughs> but everyone was amazing and everyone was lovely and I loved it. And I'd see the value in it. It's such a different way of like generating stuff but in terms of i don't know if i can tell you this kind of trade secret but i'll tell you it and then if it, if i find out i'm not allowed to tell you this executive story editor doesn't mean anything <laughs> that's the little, little inside this little insider tip it means absolutely fuck all what it means is I think there's a hierarchy of titles that ev basically everyone in around that table is a writer on the show, but depending on your CV, depending on how, mu how much you've done and how much you get paid, there's a different title for it. So executive story editor is quite low. And then the next one up is like co-executive producer or something. And the next one is whatever these stupid titles are, they all just mean writer. But it just means you, I get paid less than the person who has the title co-executive story border. It means absolutely nothing. That's but maybe I should have said that. No, that, that's great because I, I work in film as well. Um, I'm also in my mm. senior year of film school. And so I, I saw that title and I was like, I know what the job is, but the executive has me really curious about what exactly his responsibilities are. So I, uh, I love that. What you're doing is irresponsible. This club actually means something to this town. You don't think I see that every day out there on the streets? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I think that's what it's all about. Embracing change. Sam King! Being brave. Your decision to bench Jamie was a master stroke. I don't think we're allowed to talk like that at work anymore. Transition from that. Did you anticipate on acting in the show as well? And did you have prior sports experience? Or were you just thrown into it like, all right, Roy Kent's your guy, let's go. Yeah. Uh, well, so the acting part of it was, was a, is a, a, a very mad story in that I, as we were writing it, so, so Bill had known me as an actor, so it wasn't completely out of the blue. But no one was thinking of me for Roy, for sure. And as we were writing it, as we were writing it, I started to think, fuck, I really think I get this. I get Roy Kent. I could do this, but I didn't want to say, and I didn't want to embarrass anyone and make it awkward. And so on my last day in the writer's room, the night before, I did a self-tape. I didn't tell anyone. I just filmed myself being Roy Kent, did five scenes. And, I, and when I left, I said, thanks, everyone. And I left, and I emailed it. And I said, here's... I secretly think I could be Roy, 
but I didn't want to make anyone uncomfortable. If this is shit, we can pretend you never got this email and we never need to talk about it. And it will be our little secret. You know what I mean? You, you lost the email. And then luckily they liked it after I you know, sent some death threats in the post and then, uh, and then I got the part. And then in terms of sport experience, no, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I get Roy Kent, it doesn't mean I'm a, have the skills of a professional footballer. <laughs> so there was, you know, there's that side of it that's a bit more challenging than the emotional side of Roy Kent. Sure. Then, yeah. <laughs> he, he's such a, a complex character, though, um, aside from Jason, who I'm incredibly biased towards as like the biggest Saturday Night Live nerd you'll probably ever meet. Oh, right, right. Um, Roy, Roy was my favorite character and I think it's because as audience members I think we have a natural inclination towards like the tough guy who secretly yeah. is really emotional and sensitive and has all these like intellectual thoughts and feelings. Um, as an actor do you find that it's you know, is it more fun to kind of dive into the, the more oniony layers of characters like that? Or do you feel like you kind of have to work a little bit harder to put that on camera um, distinguishment between, between him, those two sides of him? Uh, I don't know the other, I, I, uh, listen, I fucking love playing Roy Kent. It's my pro definitely one of the favorite parts I've ever played. And um, you know what a privilege. Uh, in terms of like, is it is it hard to put like? I don't know. I I don't like to sound like a dickhead because also if you think I'm shit, then I'm shit. So it doesn't matter. But I do think with acting, it's like my how to do acting. The way I see it is, you you just do it. Like as in, I, if I think about it too much, then I'll fuck it will fuck me up. But I'm like, I feel it. I get it. I get. I sort of get what this, what he's doing. Just do it, and then if it reads, great. If it doesn't read, I can't help you <laughs> because I don't have any. I don't have any background skills. Where I go, okay, well, this isn't working. Is so yeah. I, I, so without sounding like a dickhead, I I got it. I felt it. So it it was not. It was difficult for various reasons, but it wasn't difficult. Like, oh, how am I? Because I've felt it. You got no fear of the other dog. For me, success is not about the wins and losses. It's about helping these young fellas be the best versions of themselves on and off the field. I always figured that tea was just going to taste like hot brown water. And you know what? I was right. Yeah, it's horrible. No, oh, thank you. Welcome to England. Uh, I would love to transition into Soulmates now, which I think the concept of the show is really fascinating. And personally, I don't think it's something I've seen a lot of or kind of tackled head on. Can you just start with kind of how the idea came to be for Soulmates? Yes. So it's now like eight years ago, me and Will Bridges, who is the co-creator and writer, co-writer and co-executive producer, again, fairly meaningless title. <laughs> and he, he, uh, he and I were writing a film together called Super Bob that we made uh, with John Dreaver a long time ago. And while we were making the film, we were talking about relationships and love and we were at different times of our lives. And he was married and about to have his first baby and I was still dating and falling in love and having, breaking, having my heart broken and just sort of mad and, and uh, talking about the idea of what is true love and is soulmates, the idea of a soulmate, does that exist? And then, I don't know, within those conversations we had this idea of what if you could prove it, what if there was a test? What if science found the human soul and then you could, there would be a test to match you with your soulmate? And then what happens? And what happens to someone like Will who is already married and has a child and what happens to someone like me who's single and you know open to true the idea of true love and then then we made a short film and then we developed it and then amc wanted to to us to make it with them and then you know and then eight years later here we are <laughs> it's, it's very simple 
Sure, yeah, just a simple eight years later. Just the average, normal, you know, Mikey story. Sure. Do you find when you're working with a futuristic setting like that, where you're kind of in control of the rules and kind of what happens, do you find that to be more liberating creatively because you just get to decide everything? Or do you actually find that it's more pressure because you're worried that people are going to kind of Christopher Nolan it and be like, well, but you know, point A to connect to point B. The future side of it or the test side of it? Or uh, like right. the futuristic element where basically you're just, you're creating rules and then in a time. Yeah, time. well, we, we, we're quite strict with it in terms of we, it was to be very simple in that we didn't want it to feel like a sci-fi show. So it is set 15 years in the future, but the only reason is to give the test time to exist, basically. But we didn't want flying cars, we didn't want robots. It should feel like our world. And the only differences are cosmetic, and they're usually technology, small technology things like the phones are glass and the, the computers are glass. And so it's, it was just thinking through like what could be the next step of a laptop or, or anything, but in a way that isn't ostentatious or distracting, like in a way it's good if you don't notice all the stuff that's in there because we just want you to focus on the, the human stories. And then the idea of the test is the rule of the test has no um because it's kind of the one part the one idea of the show is that this test exists and so the test has to be 100 percent accurate otherwise the show's pointless <laughs> otherwise the show is, has absolutely no point so that's it so it's just one rule and then everything else is our world with some fancy phones in it that's it we're ready for you now the test but I thought you guys were happy I look around and I see people living their best lives and I want to be one of them and then given kind of the like intimate nature of the show's topic did y'all do any kind of field research like did you kind of talk to real life couples and ask how they would feel about this test yes but also I do that anyway because I can't do small talk so <laughs> But my life has been field research, just asking, hello, how are you? What's going on at home? Are you all right? <laughs> like, I don't, uh, but, it, but, it, but all joking aside, I do think that that is the, the research, is just watching people and listening to people and everyone, the only thing I'm really interested in is people's love lives and people's relationships and that's the stuff, isn't it? That's the, that's the stuff of life. So, yeah, and then yes, talking to people, you know, what's your answer? Would you say the test? Oh gosh, uh, what I, I don't think so, you know, because I, I very much believe in the idea of marriage, but I also believe in the idea of divorce. And I think that humans are so complex and ever evolving that the idea that there's only one set person seems kind of irrational to me. I think, I think people can have multiple soulmates. I think you should just hang out with who you jive with. Simple as that. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And then uh, as, as we're wrapping up with our last few questions here, because I don't want to take up too much of your time, you've written primarily for television, but you've also done some feature films as well. Do you have a preference between writing screenplays versus episodics? Do you find one is structurally easier for you than the other? Uh, I'll tell you what I have discovered, and only because this is the first time I've experienced it, is writing an episode for season two of Ted Lasso was a dreamy job because it was the first time I've been in that position where you we now we've worked so hard on these characters and this world and the and and we get to now play in it in a way like it's fun like I know what I know what Higgins sounds like I know I know the actors I know I know it so well it generally felt like you're in a, uh, you know, you've got action figures and you can move them around and, and I know what they'll do that's funny. I know how they can be funny. And so it was, I don't want to say easier, but it was a joyful experience because it wasn't so hard. There wasn't all the fucking brick building you have to do. And unfortunately with Soulmates, we've created this show that's an anthology, which means we work incredibly hard. We finish an episode and then we have to start again 
with a whole new set of characters, a whole new fucking set of bricks. You go, why have we made this hard for ourselves? And then with a film, which is ultimately my, you know, my favorite uh, of all the visual mediums, it's, uh, I mean, they're all hard. <laughs> they're all hard to do. They're all really hard. But a film, I don't know what's, the, the difference between an episode of Soulmates and a film, because Soulmates is like a mini film, each episode was always the aim. But it's hard, it's harder again, because you, you're basically trying to put an hour and a half worth of a journey into, four, into half of that. For the, for the, so again, I, yeah, probably film's a bit easier. <laughs> Sure. And then uh, I, I want to end our interview on like a final existential dread question because both Ted Lasso and Soulmates kind of deals with the concept of time and that our time here is limited and that we're only valuable to other people up until a certain point. And I think that's especially relevant in the film industry where age is most definitely a number. What is something yeah. that you want to accomplish as an artist while you're still relevant and valuable? Uh, do, do, my 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 ultimate artistic goal, genuinely, and I, is to work with the Muppets. That's genuinely it. I want to make a, a Muppet movie. That's yeah. that's the. I, I think that I think the Muppets are the the highest uh, for uh, art form there is. <laughs> it's the Muppets, basically. <laughs> I, I would watch the hell out of that, Brett. So I hope it happens. Thank you so much for your time today. This was wonderful. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Take care. Take care. Some of us want more. Some of us want love. I thought taking the test was going to be the answer. I thought it would make me happy. We're going to start the machine now. Are you ready to meet your soulmate? If you want to stop at any time, just raise your right hand. Hey! Stop, stop! It's perfectly harmless. Do I, do, do I just hang out? Yeah, you're good. I'll end it. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers.